Go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Village Church. If this is your first time here, my name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Village Church. And as always, I'm thankful and grateful to see each and every one of you. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Matthew 25. We're going to be starting in verse 14 this morning as we make our way through the Olivet Discourse. Sometimes water goes flying. But as uh, we make our way through the Olivet Discourse, and uh, this morning we're going to be talking about the parable of the talents. Last Sunday, you covered the parable of the bridesmaids, basically, as Jesus told them that his kingdom was going to be like those who were patiently waiting, those who were investing their lives properly, but then those who were not investing would be caught unaware. And this week, Jesus gives a different parable of the talents, but the emphasis is exactly the same. It is an emphasis of how are you living in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ? These parables engage our imagination to consider just what it looks like to trust Jesus to deliver his kingdom. It is a kingdom that is made by his hands for his purpose, for his glory. And when Jesus came to earth, he did so to make it possible for us to gain entrance into that kingdom. But what needed to be understood and what we must still understand is that the only entrance into that kingdom is through faith in Jesus Christ. Because on the cross and through the resurrection, Jesus completely secured his kingdom. And his kingdom will be built through the redemption that is only available through Jesus. And it is through the redeeming of sinners that God is actually every single day of our lives building that very kingdom. Because through his actions, forgiveness and restoration is available through faith. And then after Jesus ascended up into heaven, we await now the second coming where just as he came in judgment in 70 AD, he will return again in judgment, but a judgment that will span the entire world and the necessity uh, that's on your life to be ready for that judgment is what are you doing to follow Jesus Christ? Are you truly a believer? Are you really living a life of faith in Jesus Christ? Because over and over in the scriptures... Jesus calls his people to follow him in countercultural ways. He calls his people to invest their lives in things that the world will not understand unless they trust in Jesus Christ. And so if you trust God, here's the key with the gospel, you will live differently. If you trust Jesus, you will invest your life differently. Trusting in Jesus means viewing the world through a different lens. Whether it's wealth, love, compassion, family, community, mission, and on and on, the scripture tells us that we will take different meaning in those things through our faith in Jesus Christ. And when you come to faith, he literally changes your life and calls you to invest these things as he has given you to invest them. And so I want to read his words starting in verse 14. For it, and we know from last Sunday that he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey. He called his servants and trusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them. And he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master." And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master said to him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I had not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. 
So take the talent from him and give it to the one who had ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Number one this morning, I want you to understand that God has called you to faithfully invest in his kingdom. God has called you to faithfully invest in his kingdom. You know, grace changes how you invest your life. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you see that your life does not belong to you. Rather, it belongs to God. The lie that many people believe when they look at followers of Jesus Christ is, oh my goodness, I don't want to be God's servant. I don't want to have a lack of freedom. They say, if I want freedom, I have to do it apart from God. Those who would follow Jesus Christ are foolish, not knowing that being apart from God is no freedom at all. You are simply a slave to sin. And that is the worst kind of slavery that can exist because in the end you will die in your slavery and you will face the condemnation that sin deserves. But through God you have the opportunity to live life as you were designed to live. And so when you come to faith in Jesus Christ it quite literally changes everything. And over the past few weeks, we've seen Jesus warn his people about the judgment of God. Keep in mind, he's still standing over Jerusalem, giving the Olivet Discourse. He's looking over the city. He's looking over the temple. He's already warned of the judgment that was going to come in 70 AD. Now he is looking forward and he's looking at his disciples and he's saying, don't think that that's the final judgment. There's going to come another judgment in the future. It's going to encompass the entire world and everyone is going to be held accountable for what they did with faith in Jesus Christ. And he begins to give these parables, these kingdom parables, to point out and say, this is what the life of faith looks like and there's always an example within it to show there is a way that you can live to reveal you don't actually have faith in Jesus Christ. So I want you to understand that there's no halfway in with these parables. He's not looking at you and saying, oh, this third servant, he was just a bad Christian, but he was still in the faith. He wasn't last week looking at those five virgins who didn't prepare for the bridegroom to come and saying, oh, they were just bad Christians. No, he's saying you're either in or you're out. Those five unprepared women, they had no faith. Therefore, they didn't enter the kingdom. That final servant, he has no faith, therefore he will not enter the kingdom. Jesus is telling them to prepare them. Understand that a few days after Jesus says this, he goes to the cross, he takes the penalty for sin. Then three days later, he rises from the dead to give them new life. And it is this faith that Jesus is centered on, this faith that he is talking about, that is preparing them to look forward to his return rather than fearing it. Note that the first two servants had no fear of the master's return. Just like last week, the five virgins that were prepared for the bridegroom to come, they were prepared for the moment of his return. They had no fear of his return. They had great anticipation. They were waiting with joy, just like these other two servants who were faithful to invest. They were waiting with joy. It is only those with no faith that dread the return of Jesus. It is only those that have no faith in the Son of God that should live with any dread in their lives at all because the grace of Jesus to redeem changes everything in your life. Every step of your life after you trust the grace of Jesus is a step in growing to understand and to live for His coming kingdom. And this is why He continually puts forward the phrase, the kingdom is like. These are not far off stories that only impact the afterlife. Each example points to something that Jesus wants to cultivate in you right here, right now. So many people that I have talked to over the years have this view of Christianity that he gives us grace, that he forgives us. And then in the end, regardless of what takes place after that moment, heaven forever. That I have come to faith in Jesus Christ, but I don't actually have to follow Jesus Christ. The grace that he's given into my life doesn't have to change my life. Faith doesn't have to be applied in my life. Faith doesn't have to impact my life. And in the end, 
I'm going to avoid hell because I have that one moment of grace to hold on to. That is not the picture that Scripture gives you over and over. And I tell you, when you read these parables, that is not the picture that these parables give you. These parables give you a picture that God has given this wonderful grace through faith into your life, and that grace changes everything, changes every moment. It makes you brand new to a new life of following Jesus Christ by which what God has invested in you, you invest through your new life. You invest your faith in this world. You invest your faith to multiply your faith into the lives of other people by proclaiming the gospel, by discipling others, by building the church of Jesus Christ. And God says that is how you live a life of faith. There is the chance, though, that you've misunderstood, that you don't want a life of faith and you just want fire insurance for the end. That is no salvation at all because that is not the grace that God has to give. God has a grace to give where he takes you from sinner condemned to hell to someone with the life of God, vibrant, the power of God, active the strength of God applied in every single day of your life where you cease to live a life by which you cannot please God because of your sin, but in which God gives you great potential through his strength to follow his son Jesus Christ into a new life by his design. And so when you read these stories, understand these parables have great intent for you to actually understand the life that God has called you to live. He has not been ambiguous. He has not been unclear. God has spelled out through his word the very life that he wants you to live. And those who have faith, they will invest accordingly. You see, God gives us this parable so that we will understand that the validity of our faith is actually seen in our actions in this life. And that is how Jesus leads into this story. Our faith in the promises that Jesus has given is revealed in how faith actually affects our present life. He's given clear commands. He's given clear pictures as to what the shape of that life will take. And if you say you can't understand what he wants from you, friend, it's quite possible that that is still sin deceiving you. I've talked to so many and say, oh, no, if you think faith creates any type of works in my life, well, Steve, you don't understand how grace works. What do you do with James chapter 2? Look at starting in verse 17. The half-brother of Jesus says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Do you think that the cross of Jesus Christ was Jesus wanting to give you a dead faith? No, the cross of Jesus Christ, Jesus died so that you could live. Jesus rose so that you could have a new life. He does not want you to have dead faith. He wants you to have a faith that works. He wants you to have a faith that has the life of Christ behind it. I know it sounds funny, but for so many, it is kind of an aha moment when I tell them to be a follower of Jesus. You have to follow Jesus. You have to follow him where he's going. There's life in it. There's action in it. And just like James tells us here, there are works involved. Those works don't gain us the grace of Jesus Christ. Those works are done because we've already received the grace of Jesus Christ. He's changed us forever. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17, explains how we are to invest if Jesus is our master and we are his stewards the Apostle Paul writes and he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's what? A new creation. Do you read that and think things are going to stay the same once you start following Jesus? No, that's not the way you would read that. Apply common sense. He says you'll be a new creation. That means everything's going to be new. Everything has changed. Why? Because the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all of this is from God. It's a part of His grace, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Note verse 20. 
because of this, or therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you know what an ambassador is? An ambassador is the representative of a foreign kingdom. And so what the Apostle Paul is saying is that once you come to faith in Christ, once you, and he uses the term reconciliation, once you have been reconciled to God, your relationship, which was separated through sin, has been made whole completely because of the work of Jesus Christ, not because of anything you've done to earn it. That gift has been given to you. Therefore, now you have the ministry of reconciliation going through the world proclaiming, I represent the kingdom of heaven. And everywhere I go, my task is to show the values of the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. My task is to look to the world and say, I was once a sinner in need of grace and God has brought me into his kingdom. You be reconciled to God. Amen. That is a lot of change. That is what faith in Jesus Christ does to you. It gives you a new life. It gives you a new kingdom. It gives you a new righteousness. Everywhere we go then, we invest our lives for the purpose of showing the kingdom of God to everyone around us. So friends, understand how you invest determines how you multiply what God has invested in you. And so the decisions that you make, the choices that you make, Every single one of them matter where the kingdom of heaven is concerned. Because understand, number two this morning, we do not invest what we have earned, but what we have been given. We don't invest what we have earned, but what we have been given. You know, when Jesus redeemed you, it wasn't because God looked at you and said, I got to have that one. That's a go-getter right there. That's a good worker. It's going to make my kingdom so much better if I draft that one into the kingdom. No, you were a sinner. You were dead in your sin. You were rebellious against God. You didn't add value to God when he redeemed you. Rather, God gave value to you. God looked at you. You were a sinner in need of a savior. And he said, I'll redeem you not because of your worth, but because of my worth because of how good God is, because of how loving God is, because of how giving God is. He redeemed you into his kingdom. And this parable is vital to understanding what takes place next. Because once God redeems you through faith, once he gives you the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ, then he says, what I've invested in you, invested in your life, invested in this world. Proclaim the gospel, make disciples, build the church. The master ascended into heaven and said, I will return and we are his servants and he has given us a great deal of riches to invest. You know, the uh, amount that he gives to each of his servants is a different vernacular than we use when we describe money. But if you read historians, the, uh, the approximation of just exactly what the, ta what the worth of one talent would be. Some people say it would be about $10,000. Some people say it would be about $30,000. But at that point in the history of antiquity, that was an incredible amount of riches. And so for you, they estimate to be just a common laborer in that day and age, it would take you somewhere between 10 to 20 years to earn one talent. And so when we look at this story, and he's looking at the disciples, the disciples are looking. He gave one servant five talents. That is more than a lifetime of wealth in that day and age. That was a ridiculous amount of money to those people. Because Jesus is looking at his disciples, and he's trying to describe in a way that they can understand just exactly what it is that God was going to invest them through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There's no amount on this earth that you can use to describe the level of riches it is to go from a sinner condemned to hell to someone who has had their entrance into the kingdom of heaven purchased, someone who has the life of God in their lives by which you don't earn it. Instead, God does it because he pays the penalty for your sins on the cross of Jesus. So he looks and he says he's invested so much into the lives of these servants but how those servants 
invest that money reveals what they actually think about their master. And the parable shows us two of the servants got it. Two of the servants understood what their master was really like. That he's the kind of man that if I invest, if I work, if I live for his kingdom, he will bless me. He will reward me. He will give me a reward for being his servant, for tending to his property. And Jesus desires for his gifts to be invested right here and right now. See, friends, some of you, the story that you are living has nothing to do with wasting money. I mean, I wish it was that simple. Don't waste your money. Okay, parable applied. Let's walk out. Let's go ahead and just don't waste your money. No, that's not really the point of the parable, and I hope you get that. I hope you get the allegory in this text that he's talking about, yeah, your finances, but he's talking about way more than that. He's also talking about your time. He's talking about your effort. He's talking about your energy. He's talking about your worship. He's talking about how you actually invest the life that God has given you because the distribution of God's gifts, it is a work of grace. It's not based on what I already have. It's not based on what I have earned. Rather, it's based on what God has given me that I don't deserve because it is God's grace that makes me sufficient to obey him. And so I have to ask the question, and I'll ask this a few times over the rest of the sermon. What am I investing my life in? What is it that I am investing in with my every single day? Am I more interested in what I can gain apart from Jesus or what I can invest for the cause of Jesus? See, some of us, and I talk to you sometimes, your life is basically defined by the value that you think you have. Some of you are pretty impressed by that. I know. And hey, I'll be honest, I'm impressed by some of you. It's like you've done pretty good for yourself. You've invested a lot of your life well, and you're building a great life. But then you think about yourself and you think, yeah, I've earned a lot. I'm pretty important. I have lots of leather bound books in my office, reeks of mahogany. <laughs> that old anchor man analogy. But that's not what we're talking about here. I'm not talking about the value that you bring to the table. I'm talking about the value that God brought to your life. Amen. I'm talking about the treasure that you have for God. I'm talking about the affection that you have in your life and the gratitude that you have in your life for exactly how much it is that you measure what God has done for you. Because if you spend all of your time so impressed with what you have done and what you have made with how much you know and how much you have accomplished then that reveals a great deal of how you devalue what God has done in your life. Because to worship God, you have to be more impressed with him than you are with yourself. Because nobody walks into the throne room of God handing him their resume. Because to know the creator of the universe is to know what real glory looks like. To walk into his throne room is to, just like Isaiah was in Isaiah chapter 6, it is to see a reflection not of your greatness, but rather to see a reflection of how much you fall short of who he is. But to see how great God is in your life. The truth is that everything in my life Everything that I have of value is by the grace of God. Therefore, it is intended to show and leave a legacy of faith. Friends, honestly, whether it is riches, whether it is talent, whether it is effort, God has called me to invest it in showing how glorious he is rather than how glorious I think I can become. Amen. Jesus invested everything into his kingdom. I don't think any one of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, would look to the cross of Jesus and say, well, Jesus, you could have given a little bit more, couldn't you? You don't look to the cross and say, you know, Jesus, you were a little bit selfish up there. You know, did you really give your all on the cross? No, when you look to the cross, you see that Jesus is all in on his kingdom. You see that Jesus is all in on the gospel. Jesus is all in on the plan of God. That is why when you consider the gospel, there is no such thing as investing part of who I am. 
You are either in or you are out. You are either a follower of Jesus or you are not a follower of Jesus. You have to look to the gospel and value it at the level that Jesus values it, not at the level that you think you want to value it. And when I look to the cross of Jesus Christ, I see a gospel that is worth the very life of the Son of God. And so the least that I can do is to give all of my life to him. That is what it means to be a servant of God. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, the apostle Paul presents the truth of what we invest our lives in, but also to be applied to Jesus. Paul writes, he says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I talk to a lot of people uh, in my time who are dissatisfied with your spiritual life. That's kind of how you put it to me. You say, I'm not fully satisfied. And, and here's what I want you to understand. When you are dissatisfied with your spiritual life, you're going to look for someone to blame for it. And a lot of people blame me. I know that. It's the job I have. I'd be a better spiritual life if Steve was a better pastor. And so people come to me and they say that and then they leave the church. And I tell people all the time, I, I take the hits. I can take it because I don't care. My spiritual life is good. Is real good, all right? But the key that you need to understand is if you're dissatisfied with your spiritual life, that's on you. How do I know that? Because I guarantee you, and in 20 years of pastoral ministry, this has not been proven false. When you are dissatisfied with your spiritual life, every single time I can show you a person who is sowing little. But if I start talking about another part of your life, I will find where you are sowing bountifully somewhere else in your life and you are reaping somewhere else in your life a bountiful harvest. It's just not for the gospel. Therefore, it's not stoking your affections for God. It's not stoking your desire for him. It's not building the kingdom of heaven. It's not proclaiming the gospel to anyone. It's not making a single disciple. It's not building the church. Yet you're dissatisfied with your spiritual life because you want to reap bountifully where you aren't invested. That's not how it works. Amen. You're reaping somewhere. It always amazes me, and I even see this with pastors sometimes, but it's rampant in the church where people will say, Phew. I tell you, if I get any busier, I'm not going to know what to do. I just don't have any more time. Every single minute of every single day, I'm busy with something. But then social media came along. And now we actually see what people mean by they're so busy. With men, it's college football on Saturdays. You're super busy, but you have eight hours every Saturday to watch 20-year-old boys throw a leather ball down a field. And then this afternoon, what are you going to do? Man, phew, NFL Sunday ticket, eight more hours. Now they've the ones that have gone pro. I got to watch them. And then basketball season's coming, baseball season's coming, this, that, the other thing. I got a binge watch. I got a new season of Stranger Things coming out. I, I mean, it's not that you don't know how to commit. You do. You just commit to really, really stupid stuff. Whatever you sow, that's what you will reap. And so if you are dissatisfied with your spiritual life, stop looking at other people. Stop looking who to blame and start looking in the mirror. Start looking at what you're actually sowing in your life because Jesus sowed generously through the cross and the bounty of the return from the cross of Christ is huge, but the return is seen in the life of every redeemed sinner. Yep. Jesus gave absolutely everything so that we can produce the fruit of faith in our lives. And the first two servants understood that. They knew the master. They watched how the master lived. They watched how the master had grown his wealth, how he invested his time, how he treated his people. And they invested by his standard. And what does the text say? The text says they doubled their investment. That's a pretty good reaping. That's a pretty good bounty to bring in. And so that begs the question, friend, what are you doing with your life? 
Are you living as one that God has given grace to? Because if you are, then you will multiply your faith in the lives of others in the way God commands through his word. Look for how your investments are creating profit of faith in this world. Because where your investments are, that's what you're going to profit in in your life. It's an obvious common sense thing. But some of you, I know that you've got a low self-esteem where your life in God is concerned. And you say, man, Steve, I wish I could have that life. I know there are some superstar Christians and they are investing and I look up to those people, but I'm always going to be watching them from the cheap seats of Christianity because God hasn't invested in me for me to have that kind of profit in my life. And my question is, where did you get that? Where in Scripture do you get that there's some level of super Christian that you cannot attain to? I will tell you, God has invested in the life of every single person that he has ever redeemed bountifully, generously. You can have the life that God has called you to have. Here's how I know this. In Hebrews chapter 13, I want to start reading in verse 20. The author of Hebrews is praying for those that are reading this book. And he says, now may the God of peace who brought again, who, excuse me, the God of peace who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant. He's just like gospel, gospel, gospel. Verse 21, may that God equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Two things. The first one is he prays with a presupposition that God will equip you. So he prays this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, recounting everything that he's written in Hebrews. And he says, may that God equip you through faith. That gives us the idea, yes, I can invest in the kingdom of God and I will reap a reward for that investment. But there's a second thing that he says in this text that is vital too. When he says, may you do his will Working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through what? Through your ability? Through your talent? Through how much you think you can do? Through the level of self-esteem that you have for yourself? No. What does he say? Through Jesus Christ. He's saying the level of equipping that every single Christian has is not determined by what you think and what you can do. It's determined by the very God that redeemed you. And if Jesus was generous enough to give his life for you on the cross, don't you think he's generous enough to give you the power to obey his call in your life? Friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ goes out the most effectively through people who actually have faith in Jesus because when you actually have faith in Jesus, you go all in. There is no plan B for the follower of Jesus Christ. There is no backup plan. There is no failure plan. There is no, well, if that doesn't work out, then I got this other thing waiting for me in the corners. No, there is only faith in Jesus Christ because this is all we have, because he is the only God, because he is true. His promises are true. He will equip you. He will work through you. He will strengthen you. He will give you the power. He will aid you to live up to whatever calling he has given you in his life because the true follower of Jesus Christ looks to the master when he is leaving and the master says, invest. And the servant that loves the master says, yes. And that's it. Because Jesus keeps his word. See, friends, in this context, it's to invest the gospel of Jesus into this world to build his kingdom. That is the mission that he has given and he hasn't given us another one. So when he returns, know this, the legitimacy of our faith will be revealed in how we invested in our lives in this world. Because number three this morning, it's this simple. How you invest your life will ultimately reveal what you trust in. How you invest your life will reveal what you trust in. We must not invest our lives foolishly. We've seen over the past few weeks, it's urgent. 
No one has promised tomorrow. No one knows the day or the hour. But it came to those five virgins who were unprepared. It came to them in a moment where they didn't expect it. Note the language that is used to describe the relationship between the servants and the master. The servants knew their master was going, and there was going to be a good length of time while he was gone. But the text never says that the servants knew when the master was coming home. Because it wasn't on the servants when he came home. That was up to the master. He could come home whenever he wanted to and hold them accountable in that moment. Therefore, follower of Jesus, you must live as though he could return whenever he wants to, at any moment that he wants to. Because here's the deal. That's what he's going to do. He's not asking me if I'm ready. He's telling me to be prepared. And there's a difference. See, friends... Francis Chan, one of the greatest things he ever said that has stuck with me for many years, said that the greatest tragedy of this life is that we would become very talented in things that ultimately don't matter. <laughs> Friends, that is always a danger in our lives. Because I've talked to some of you about things that you are very passionate about, and I've walked away not understanding how any human being would ever devote a minute to what you <laughs> devote to. Because we like doing some stupid things. We like to waste time because we like to think that we have decades and centuries ahead of us just to waste. But then we treat the gospel as though it's like the end of the college semester and we've got the final tomorrow that we're unprepared for and we're just going to pull an all-nighter to be prepared for the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't work that way. It's about all of your life. It's about every moment. It's about investing we do not have a problem with willingness to commit. We simply commit to the wrong things. But friends, the question you've got to ask yourself is, what do the things that you are the most committed to in this life say about your faith? Our commitment problem is that we often invest in the things that will never reap the return of God's reward. It would be a tragedy if in my life, the only reward I ever knew from what I was investing in was in this life. Because God has a vision for so much more of my life. Instead, we often find ourselves in the shoes of the servant who hid his treasure in the dirt. I mean, you think about that. The other servants are out there. They're investing. They're working. And the third servant, he just goes, buries it in the dirt. Now, think about it. He wasn't a hen sitting on the egg the whole time. He was doing something while the master was gone. He was devoting his time to something while the master was gone. But the text leads us to understand that something was meaningless. It was worthless. That's why it's important that the Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians 3, 17, he says, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. There are no throwaway decisions. There are no meaningless choices. Every choice you make in this life is an investment. Therefore, in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, choose Wisely, The hope is in realizing that the whatevers of life will tell us something about Jesus. Since he is God of all, it's all his. Everything that I do in life extends into his kingdom. Therefore, what I do matters and will reap eternal rewards if I do it faithfully. Galatians 6, 9 is so vital when we think about this. It says, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. It's an important precept there. The first one is, of course, the promise. Promises in due season we will reap. The warning is don't give up. Why would he warn us with that? There's an important stu Bible study tool here. Whatever he warns you about is what your temptation is going to be. He wouldn't warn you about it if you weren't going to be tempted to do it. Well, the Apostle Paul, because he says it twice, he says, don't grow weary. And then he says, don't give up. He doubles down on it. It's a double imperative. He knows that there's going to be times in your life where you're going to want to quit because you're weary. Life is hard. Faith is hard. 
Enduring is difficult because there's sometimes in life where you either just came to faith in Jesus and you're like, okay, I want to invest. I want to do the right thing. Or you had this great moment of revival in your life. and You're like, okay, great. I want to invest wisely. And then a month later, you lose steam. Something difficult happens. Got a phone call last night from a friend of mine who's a pastor and uh, he wanted some advice and he sometimes people still tell me things that kind of shock me and there's a situation in one of the families of the membership of his church and it was a shocking situation even for me and he was weary and he said I don't want to deal with this I want to quit he was calling me tell him this don't quit don't grow weary and he said seminary didn't prepare me for this and I just told him I said, friends, there's a lot of things in life that only life will teach you. Amen. So don't give up. Don't quit. Because he couldn't see the reward. All he saw was the pain. He couldn't see reaping in due season. All he could see was this is hard. Friends, when Jesus gives you this analogy, he's not telling you it's easy. He's actually warning you, following him is going to be the most difficult thing that you ever do because there's going to be moments where you're going to say, is the master ever returning? But then he gives us these promises where he says, I will, don't give up. To trust God is to invest your life for God. You know what we know about this third servant? The most telling thing of this third servant who didn't invest his money is his response when judged by the master. What did the first two say? The first two didn't have to say much. They just pointed to the multiplication. They just say, you gave me five, here's five more. You gave me two, here's two more. The third guy, his tone's a little different, isn't it? He starts bargaining. He starts complaining. He starts criticizing, but never himself. He says, I knew you were a hard man. He basically looks to God and says, you want to know why I didn't multiply your kingdom? Because you're a mean God. Because you were hard on me. Because you didn't give me an easy life. This is all your fault. He says, here, have your one reward. He actually reveals he knew a completely different master than the other two servants knew. The other two servants had faith. He had none. The other two servants were worshiping God and who he really is and what he has revealed through Jesus. The third servant, I don't know who he was worshiping, but it wasn't the one true God. Friends, Jesus doesn't lay out expectations that won't pay off in the end. He invests and he reaps. He is God. He never fails. There is no risk in living for God. Because to live for God, it might look like risk according to the rules of this world, but the rules of this world are nothing compared to the eternal reward that God offers Jesus. Friend, whatever you are investing your life in is meaningless if its foundation is not the cross of Jesus Christ. Note this. This is what the text tells us. Our master will return. And on that day... The truth of Jesus Christ and our faith, it will be seen. Yes. So I ask you, do you have faith in Jesus? And if you say yes, I follow up with, where are the signs of faith in your life? Where's the fruit of your salvation? What are you investing your life in? It's the main question today. Because if you follow Jesus, there will be evidence of your investment a few application points this morning first faith is seen through action faith is always seen through action secondly god has commanded you to invest in his kingdom thirdly god will equip you to the work he calls you to that's the hardest thing for some people to believe that when god calls you to obedience he won't leave you stranded <laughs> God will always equip you to the level of faith that he is calling you to. And then fourthly, investing in God's kingdom is always profitable. Amen. There is no wasted investment in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So live for it. 